like it or lump it, the Bills making quick work. Joe Brady is returning. He is now officially the Bills offensive coordinator. I'm Kevin Carroll. Welcome to the Buffalo End Zone Podcast. And I'm John Scott. Not surprising, but still something worth discussing, especially, I'll admit, I was someone who said I think they maybe should have gone a different direction. Yeah, we started this conversation right after the Bills lost, and then it continued after locker cleanout day and after Coach McDermott spoke and Brandon Bean spoke, and we heard from players, coaches, Bean himself, that they thought Joe Brady did a good job, and that led me to believe that this was indeed that the way they were going to go. And I'm kind of for it. I know you weren't for it. I think there's a lot that can be taken out of the nine games where he was calling plays that you could say you saw definitive improvements in the offense, especially with certain players who were way more involved down the stretch than they were earlier in the season when Ken Dorsey was there. To me, it's all about what is Joe Brady's spin. It was alluded to by, I believe, Brandon Bean or Sean McDermott and maybe even others in the end-of-season comments that he really wasn't able to put any sort of his spin in terms of play calling or schematics because they were he was basically just taking Ken Dorsey's playbook and, and calling it. Um, now he's calling it differently than what Dorsey was, and that's maybe where you saw glimpses of, hey, this is this is good, this is improvement. To me, I don't need the Bills' offense to drastically change, but I don't want to see as much of this let's stay beholden to what Brian Dable did, which is kind of what Ken Dorsey did, which is then I don't want that to be what Joe Brady is. It's the same stuff that we clamored for going into this season when Ken, Ken Dorsey was still the offensive coordinator and play caller. More motion, more variety in personnel packages, and that's what you want to see. And I think you saw a good amount of that in, in small sample sizes, which doesn't make sense. So you saw small sample sizes of that from Joe Brady. Um, what sort of evolution does the Bills offense take with him now fully in the saddle and with a full off season to implement what he wants to do. And Joe Brady, offensive coordinator before with the Carolina Panthers, ultimately was let go there. So he does bring something else to the table, John. And I will start off with Josh Allen recommending or whatever. You go to, does Josh Allen have a say in the offensive coordinator? And the first thing that was said to me when this happened was are you just going to let Josh Allen dictate who the offensive coordinator is forever? And I don't think that that's the case here. I don't think that Josh Allen is, as it was put to me, pulling an Aaron Rodgers and basically controlling what the Bills are going to start to do on offense. I don't see it like that. I mean, Brady and Dorse, Ken Dorsey, it didn't work out. That doesn't mean that he's done it all the time and he's going to be wrong all the time if he's comfortable and Josh is seeing how the offense evolved and what could possibly happen moving forward I don't have a problem with them saying that Josh Allen did have input in it he should he's the franchise quarterback he should have input in a lot of things Mm -hmm. that's what franchise quarterbacks do hey Brandon Bean isn't going to say Josh put down a list of players you want on this team and I'll make sure that I get them but there is conversations that are had between Allen and the upper people in the Bills organization that a lot of other people, if not most of them, are not privy to from the player-staff relationship, executive staff, and, and the front office standpoint. That's what should happen. I think you take it into account. I think then you say, well, we liked what we saw from Brady in the home stretch. McDermott even referenced the relationship and the the growth there between Allen and Brady. The one thing that stood out above anything from what I heard from players initially and then at the end of the season when they had a month and a half, two months of, of Joe Brady in the offensive coordinator position was energy. And that was the overwhelming universal word used to describe what made Brady great for them as a unit was I think it was Khalil Shakir said, even on the days where maybe we didn't have the juice, he infused it into us, was able mm-hmm. to elevate us. And w- remember when Dorsey was was fired, 
one of the talking points was they just don't look like they're having fun. They don't look like they have the energy. They just, the eye test of the execution certainly wasn't there, but just the feel and the energy around that group was low, Yeah, which is so counter to what it's been since the Josh Allen ascent of 2019 and beyond, and it looked a little bit more like you saw that down the home stretch, even if X's and O's wise and doing your job and execution wasn't always clean, the energy and the vibe around them, especially around Josh Allen, which was the most important, mm-hmm. that I, whatever throttled down energy that he was talking about at one point of, <laughs> oh, I'm not, you know, I'm trying to control my emotions better. No, he's flexing, he's shouting on the sidelines. That's the Allen that we've become to know as he's become one of the best quarterbacks in football. That seemed to return as well. So, again, now it's you got to wait to see. The okay, it's the same thing I even said when Dorsey was hired, and it was the same thing year two going into Dorsey. We could talk about it for months and months and months of what needs to happen. You're not really going to see the results and the change until at least a month plus into the regular season next year of truly how different and unique is Joe Brady's system compared to what the Bills have been doing over the past four or five years. And we can get to some things that you can actually take away from what happened when he took over this season back in November, John, of James Cook being more involved, Khalil Shakir, that's when he started to come on. All of a sudden, Dalton Kincaid, the guy you brought in to stretch the field, is now running routes down the field. So that even based off of using Ken Dorsey's playbook and making slight adjustments to it can lead you to believe that that's on tape right now. You sit down with Joe Brady on what he will bring moving forward to this team, and I'm sure it was, well, we're going to expand more on that. We brought Dalton Kincaid in to be a playmaker. We found someone in Shakir and James Cook getting more involved in the offense. You would think more James Cook in the passing game. I still think that that's something that needs to be there, and that probably wasn't part of what Ken Dorsey was doing. So all those things. Things are there moving forward, but you saw glimpses of it during the season when uh, Brady took over that, okay, this is more, even though it wasn't effective like you would want it all the time and they weren't blowing teams out, you got a glimpse of a little bit more of what you want to see with the offense. I mean, I could run down the list of all the things without even talking about Scheme and all of this. These are the things with what they have already that have to get better. I think you need to use James Cook better in the passing game. You need to utilize Dalton Kincaid. How does he intertwine 12 personnel? Because you're paying Dawson Knox a ton of money, and he cannot just be a blocking tight end at a $14 million cap hit. You just can't do that. You have to, above anything else, find out why Stephon Diggs was not Stephon Diggs for the last three months of the season and get it back to that. And then that's not even taking into account what additions are made into the pass catchers. Does the offensive line have to make any sort of moves? We're going to continue this conversation as the week goes on where we're going to actually delve into each position group individually and discuss that quickly. But those are just the questions, again, before you see who they draft, to see who they sign, see who they don't sign, those are the pieces that are already there, the core of the Bills' offense, and you have to figure out how to utilize that and then take in the, well, how would you utilize whoever replaces Trent Sherfield, whoever replaces Gabe Davis should he leave, whoever replaces Deontay Hardy, how do you implement a second running back, all of these things that are going to have to be questions, that's what you need to see, and um, above all, keep Josh Allen on the up. Well, yeah, and that was the other thing that, I mean, I think this is more of where the Bills were trying to get into the postseason, trying to win the AFCs. Once you're in the postseason, things are different. We saw more of Josh Allen running with the ball once Brady took over. But, John, that's where maybe slippery slope is the wrong term, but you don't want to get too carried away with that, saying that that was a Brady thing. I think it was more of, listen, guys, we're in a tough position. Yeah. We have to win. So no matter what, go out there and do what it takes to win. And you get that with Josh Allen. So I think if 
the season starts off next year and Josh kind of goes back to not running the ball as much and being a little more cautious, I think that's probably still the the game plan with Josh until you need to unleash the beast that Josh Allen is later in the season. And I've always maintained it shouldn't be this conversation of Josh Allen needs to run less. Josh Allen just needs to run smarter, and that's sliding. And you saw good steps forward, even Sean McDermott alluded to it and acknowledged it at the end of the season that he took steps forward in terms of knowing when and when not to lower the shoulder, drop the boom, encourage contact. You saw week one, he's jumping into people eight yards from the first down. That's stupid, Josh (laughs) Allen. That's not the type of running you need to see. It's late in the season, all right, you need to get those extra few yards. You need to get that first down. But even down this stretch, the back end, when they needed him to use his legs more, he was being more careful and sliding more. And and I think that that, again, should be something that I I don't want to just let's tuck it in the back pocket until we need it. You still can utilize it throughout the entire season. He just has to be smart about it. Now, when you you and I talked right after – the loss to the Chiefs, and we were talking about this topic, you had brought up that maybe getting a new voice in there would have been something beneficial for this unit. Do you still kind of lean that way with this, that maybe staying with Joe Brady might have been something that you would have done differently? I think there are other coaches out there that would have been Good additions. Mm-hmm. I mean, we don't know what's happening with Eric Bieniemy. That would be something that would be interesting to me. A proven guy with a superstar elite quarterback who's won Super Bowls, who has shown, even though it was in coordination with Andy Reid, has shown a lot of the things that when we talk about, well, the Bills offense needs more of this, it's because we see it from Kansas City. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, who knows? He may be retained whenever uh, someone is hired, but I think it's going to be Ben Johnson in Washington, so – he wouldn't probably keep another offensive guy like mm-hmm. that. So who knows? I, to me, I'm fine with Brady. I thought he did he did some good things. This is where I just want to see how different is the scheme. If him and Josh have a great relationship, which is clear, the energy, being a younger guy, he seems to be more personality-wise closer to Brian Dable than he did Ken Dorsey, who even though Dorsey's you know, throwing tablets and getting fired up in the booth, he just doesn't – he didn't come across – this big energy rah-rah type mm-hmm. of guy. I think Brady is more like that. And so the voice thing, like, I think it'll be fine. And I just, though, just don't want it to be – I want to see more change on the field in the way the games are called, the way the games are executed, the way this offense looks and operates. That's what I want to see. That was my biggest thing. The voice also I think would be good, but that could also come from whoever they now fill the quarterback coach with. Yeah. I just want to ask this coming off of what you just said, because you're there, you're at practice. Well, when the Bills practice and didn't just do walkthroughs, but was it noticeable even at practice with the offense? And, you know, we all got used to the videos of all the wide receivers dancing a few years ago and everyone getting all hyped up. That kind of trailed off as it looked like the Bills offense was sputtering early in the season. Was it noticeable to you as someone at practice seeing how the group just worked as far as the offense goes, as far as bringing it to practice on a Wednesday or a Thursday? Yeah, I think you could you could feel a, a boost in the energy. I feel even just the interactions between Joe Brady and the offensive guys, the quarterbacks, other position groups as well. I, you just – you could feel it a little bit more. And that's not to be too critical of Ken Dorsey. I think Dorsey did some good things. But, again, I just think personality-wise, Dorsey is not what Joe Brady is. Joe Brady's a younger, more energy, rah-rah type of guy. And I think that is better suited for this group, especially the quarterback like Josh Allen. Okay, so... Joe Brady gets announced. We're still up in the air on, will Sean McDermott keep pulling double duty as far as the defensive coordinator job goes? And we now know from over the weekend that Eric Washington has moved on to the Chicago Bears. So while they get Joe Brady in and remove the interim tag, the 
assistant head coach slash defensive line coach has now moved on to take a D.C. job with the Chicago Bears. So there's an opening there. And I know we had talked about Bobby Babbage's situation as well. To me, that would indicate, because as you said, he was named the assistant head coach. So you would almost think, while John Butler called plays in the preseason for one game, I think it might have been the Pittsburgh game or something, it was Eric Washington with the assistant title. Clearly, Eric Washington wanted to be a defensive coordinator again. If that was on the table here with the Bills, Mm -hmm. I think he probably would have stayed. Instead, he goes to the Chicago Bears. I don't know what that means for whether or not if that's an indicator that McDermott's going to keep it as he'll be the defensive play caller or if he's still mulling it over but made it clear you're not in that mix right there. To me, and I've said this in particular with Bobby Babbage, I just feel strongly that He's ready for a defensive coordinator position. He's getting looks for the defensive coordinator positions with multiple interviews. And I just feel that if the Bills don't give him that title, there's a strong possibility he may leave for that. And then you'd be looking at two position coaches right. gone. I will say this. Every defensive lineman that I spoke to, off the record, on the record, incredible praise for Eric Washington. And I know people, especially based on their performance against the Kansas City Chiefs and their performances at the end of season losses in the playoffs, have not been happy with the performance of the defensive line. And that's very valid. They laid a major egg in the Kansas City game, and they should have been better. Eric Washington, though, I, I think the thing that all players would tell me is they're not coach. He's not coaching you to his specific scheme. He's coaching you as an individual player. So Ed Oliver and Jordan Phillips are not the same player. So he's going to coach Jordan Phillips how to pass rush and how to play different than Ed Oliver. And the same is going to go for Greg Rousseau versus Von Miller, and, and so be it. Mm-hmm. I think it's also fair for people to say, well, if he's so good of a coach, why didn't Boogie Basham work out? Why did it take so long for A.J. Epinesa? Why did they lay an egg at this point? All that. Very fair. I think it is a loss. I'll be curious what they do at the defensive line spot. But I don't think it's something – it's not seismic, but it's not something I think you just brush under the rug. With how well uh, the defense as a whole did towards the end of the season and were actually able to win some games for the Bills down the stretch as they – fought their way into the playoffs I'm still leaning as McDermott still pulling double duty and being the defensive coordinator I don't know if part of the problems that the team had in the playoffs was that McDermott was spending too much time with the defense and whatnot but I I think they just did such a great job under him so where does that (coughs) excuse me leave Bobby Babbage if he wants or you want to retain him to be maybe the defensive coordinator in title, but maybe McDermott's still heavily involved. Which I believe is my understanding of what's happening with Eric Washington. He will not be calling plays. He'll just be the defensive coordinator with the head coach, Eber Fuse. I think that's how you say it. Um, him still call him calling the defense in Chicago. I think that's a possibility. Listen, in my conversations with Bobby Babich, is even last year when he was elevated or switched to linebacker position, It was bolstering his resume at the guidance of Sean McDermott to better prepare him for a defensive coordinator position. Hey, you've worked with the safety successfully. Move here to the linebackers. You have a better feel for the defense as a whole, and this will help you get to the path of being a defensive coordinator. So they've been together for a really long time, dating back to Carolina. So they're very close, and Sean McDermott absolutely understands what I what Bobby Babbage's ultimate goals are. So I, I don't mm-hmm. think it would be any surprise. So I, to me, these conversations are probably being had. And Sean might say, as I pointed out before, I'm going to keep the defensive play caller stuff because we did well. I thought it was the best for the team. And selfishly, he, I don't know if he would say this in their comp, but selfishly, as I said, if his job's on the line, right. he wants to have his hands on as many things in control to steer his own fate rather than maybe pass it off on a first-time defensive coordinator who may be prepared but is certainly going to have growing pains as all 
first-time coordinators do, and then that could any in any way contribute to McDermott's seat getting hotter. So it remains to be seen. You kind of thought with Brady being announced, maybe something else, but, I mean, this thing's going to take time to play out, John. Like the head coaching hiring cycle has been playing out, and – you still have one Bill Belichick still out there, not hired at this point with just a couple of teams out there still without a head coach. Kind of shocking because it seemed like with how Harbaugh was with the L.A. Chargers, it seemed like Belichick was in that same boat with the Atlanta Falcons, that it was just a matter of time and then ultimately did not happen and Bill Belichick is still without a job. Shocking, but not shocking, right? Because we've obviously had a very close look at how Belichick has been with Brady, without Brady, with a good quarterback, with not good quarterbacks, with a great quarterback who can overcome some roster deficiencies and with a roster that couldn't. Mm -hmm. And this is where I don't know where the conversations are. Was Belichick demanding to also be in control of player personnel? I know from a New England perspective, you heard a lot of people from that area say maybe if Belichick was willing to relinquish those duties, he'd still be with the New England Patriots. I don't know. Um, but to me, him from a player personnel evaluation standpoint, not good. Right. <laughs> that's that's why the Patriots are where they are. As a head coach, there's still something there. But also he's in his early 70s. If you're a team with the young group of players and looking to – have more of a long-term vision, how long is Bill Belichick going to coach if you hired him now? Into his 80s? So, I mean, you want to find stability, which most organizations that are in these hiring cycles have not had. And so if you're going to hire Bill Belichick in his early 70s or even Pete Carroll in his early 70s, what is the long-term outlook? The Bills are obviously the ironic poster child for this because Marv Levy was old when they're going to all of these Super Bowls and that guy, just shout out to Marv Levy, he looks incredible for almost 100 years old. Like, he looks incredible and seems to be in great shape and all of that, but he could coach into his mid-80s. I mean, that that's what you would, you're looking for here. So it, it's shocking, but it's not. Here's the thing, the biggest question. He's not going to get a job this time. Why, especially at his age and a year removed, is there any belief that, he would be more of a desirable candidate next year. Unless he takes a year off and just completely changes and becomes almost a different person and maybe offers something else to the table. But I don't see Bill Belichick coaching again. I don't see, A, for him, why would you want to go somewhere and destroy your legacy B, Bill Belichick, with his age and where he's at, was more built for what Jim Harbaugh is getting with the Chargers, a team that's ready to go, that is just jump in there, take them over, we've got a decent roster. Um, it would be ironic. Maybe Belichick just becomes a TV analyst and is all of a sudden one of the most likable guys out there because he's not – grumpy Bill Belichick at a podium after a game because he has no team he has to look after and just the view of Bill Belichick changes moving forward. Belichick during those what was it NFL 100 when they did the top 100 yes. players he was really good he yeah. was really engaging and and someone that was entertaining he showed some personality with a little quips and a little jokes and stuff like that I, I think he could do well in the TV realm but I think he wants to coach. And there is something. He's so close to breaking Don Shula's wins record. To me. And you him, know that's going to be tough. Absolutely. And the only thing now is if we're talking about him waiting a year and what would change. What if the Dallas Cowboys don't succeed? Mike McCarthy on his last year of his deal. There's a lot of people on the outside that have said, well, what if Sean McDermott? gets fired after next season because they once again don't achieve whatever. Buffalo would be another team that has everything in, in place that, like you said, you just slide on in. There are other teams around the National Football League that you could say, well, what if this doesn't work? They have the quarterback. They have this. You never know, right? And what if 
the Giants get a really good young quarterback, and they're like, uh, Dave's took us to the postseason year one, but maybe we do there. He has history with the Giants, obviously. Yeah. The New York Jets, they could get another quarterback or something like that. Could there you were- imagine after what he did to the Jets that he ended up there? I just can't. The Jets are a team that I would just put off the table. That's fair. I, I'm just I'm putting it out there of teams yeah. that could have a young quarterback or have an established quarterback. Dallas and Buffalo would probably be there. What about the Philadelphia Eagles? It seems like Nick Sirianni, it seems ridiculous that he was even in the position to have to fight for his job. But what if he doesn't pan out after this year? Okay, we made these coordinator changes. Things didn't get better. Philadelphia could be something like that. What if Mike Tomlin decides to give it up after next wow. season? There's a lot of places that could. Now, I don't, Pittsburgh probably wouldn't be it because they don't have a quarterback. But there's some places, prominent places, should things fall a certain way, that it could be, hey, 73, 74-year-old Bill Belichick, come in here, let's give it a five, six-year run, and let's go. All right, you 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 convinced me right there. I, I mean, I wasn't looking that far into the future, but you're right. There will be teams that will be plug and play, as to say, that will be looking for a coach after next season for sure. And, I mean, Dallas would just – it would just make the most sense because it doesn't make sense, but it makes sense if that makes sense. And Bill Parcells did it, and you know Belichick and Parcells, you know, kind of – Right. Parallel and things like that. It, it would be interesting. And again, I'm not saying Sean McDermott's going to get fired or any of this stuff. I'm just saying these are the paths of destinations that potentially could suit Bill Belichick better. Mike Vrabel's fascinating. Pete Carroll, I think, is also interesting. And then who the heck knows, you know, what else happens. Yeah. But um, it was a, not youth movement, but it's a new age for all of these hires this year. And it, it leaves the older dogs, the established head coaches on the outside looking in. Yeah, I think we're at that time right now where a lot of guys or teams are going with the youth movement. Well, we're pretty sure the 49ers and the Chiefs aren't going to be looking for a new head coach anytime soon, although maybe Andy Reid wins the Super Bowl and walks off. Who knows what's going to happen, but we do have the Super Bowl now, John, and if I could go off the Internet, it was the matchup that no one really wanted no one wants to see it. The Chiefs back in the Super Bowl again, which I get now when you look back on the hatred people had for the Patriots in the Super Bowl every year. I think I brought this up before. That's starting to build with the Chiefs. I think the 49ers were a no-brainer, but the Lions, such a great story surrounding the Lions. And the fact that they had that huge halftime lead is just super disappointing that they let that one get away from them. But here we are, John. It is a Super Bowl matchup that shouldn't come as a surprise, despite the fact that no one really is looking forward to it. I try to be as impartial as I can covering the National Football League. But when it comes to the Baltimore Ravens, that's the Cleveland Browns team that was stolen from my city as a child <laughs> and moved and then won a Super Bowl in 2000. I have no issue ever watching that organization fall short of anything. And I got to be honest, I don't find the Chiefs unlikable. I think Travis Kelsey's hilarious. I don't have a problem with Patrick Mahomes. I definitely, as we've discussed in this show, I think the Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey thing is kind of fun. Who cares? Jason Kelsey's hilarious. I love how the mic picked up afterwards. Travis said, oh, glad to see you kept your shirt on this time. (laughs) I just think it's fun. I have no problem with the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, depending upon maybe who, if they played a different team in the AFC Championship game, maybe I would have been rooting for the dynasty to stop. But I don't find them unlikable at this point in time. It's bound to happen. Like right. It always happens with dynasties, the Yankees, the Golden State Warriors, who the Lakers, the Boston Celtics, whoever. The Blackhawks, I think people got sick of Patrick Kane mm-hmm. and all. Of, like, whatever. You just get tired of it. I'm not there yet with the Kansas City Chiefs. In terms of the NFC Championship game, I was rooting for Detroit. I wanted them to win. Here's the one thing I want to ask you because I got into a big to-do <laughs> in a text chain with college buddies 
about Dan Campbell's decision making on fourth down and how that was the reason that Detroit ultimately lost the game. I was in the minority. I was alone in a group of like eight people in this text. I had no problem with Dan Campbell going for it on fourth down. In my opinion, the bigger issues were Josh Reynolds dropped two passes, one on fourth down that should have been caught, another on a third down that would have been a first down after the game was tied and this momentum, as he catches it, I mean, even if you don't score, you're ripping off more time. Right. The mo- You stop the bleeding a little bit. And what makes a 48-yard field goal a sure thing? We certainly know that from a Bills perspective. I know San Fran- or Santa Clara, where they're playing versus Orchard Park, the weather and, and kicking conditions probably different. But Jake Moody on the Niners missed a 47-yarder earlier in the game. What makes it uh, – and so – and Ben Solak, someone who came on the show last year, he pointed out the a few of like the analytics of the the points lost from certain decisions. The ridiculous off the dude's face mask that Brandon IU catches was like a play that swung things over five and a half points. Right. Like the dude should have caught it, or it was insane that Brandon IU <laughs> then caught it. Like that's a bigger deal. Josh Reynolds dropping that fourth down pass. Like these are bigger issues to me than Dan Campbell not kicking a field goal. And I also made it sure to point out, at the end of the first half on fourth down, they did kick the field goal when they could have really gone for a kill shot and gone up an extra four more points. I will never have a problem at this stage in the game going for it on fourth down. I just, I'm a big just keep going for it on fourth down type of guy. I might sneeze in one second here. But that's that's Dan Campbell's philosophy. That's where they got, that's how they, in part got to where they are like I do agree in with my analytics philosophy in general you can't simply go by the numbers like you have to take the flow of the game you have to take just the feel of things you have to take like your own gut feelings into account you can't just simply say well the numbers are saying 60 percent you should go for it here I agree with that and that's what I think the, the counter is just take the three points then you're going to tie and all this stuff but to me, I, I was completely fine with it. And I know that is like the talking point here of the collapse of the Detroit Lions was Dan Campbell should not have gone for it on fourth down like he did. And I disagree. Yeah, and I disagree, too. You see that all over the place. When it comes to kicking, John, I've never been to that stadium out there, so I'm not going to claim to know. But I do know this from being friends with a kicker, that the difference between kicking off turf in that natural grass that's out there and the conditions that surround it, you would probably not as well kicking off the natural grass, get what you, the desired result. I think that would play in a role to it as well. And with the weather and the conditions and whatnot that, you know, uh, artificial surface, it's just easier to get through the ball. Shout out Edmonds. Shout out to Chris Edmonds, former kicker at Arkansas. And about 10 other schools. <laughs> <laughs> Go Edmonds. But uh, so here we have it, John. I mean, early thoughts on the Super Bowl. Of course, as we get closer, we'll get to it. I think I saw the 49ers minus two and a half. Two and a half. Yep. I, so I, that sounds right. Here's the thing. Can you bet against Patrick Mahomes? I mean, this was the one run where people were trying to the first time he's been, since his rookie year, he was back-to-back weeks and underdog against the Bills, underdog against Baltimore. And it's this offense is deprived of weapons. And after Marquez Valdez-Scantling was dropping yeah, wh- passes. What left the heck was that catch all about? <laughs> after dropping passes left and right during the regular season against the Bills and then the Ravens, he makes absolutely critical great catches down the field and that came up to play Travis Kelsey people saying oh he's washed you could see the end incredible I mean he's he's been delivers in the playoffs he's been Travis Kelsey of old this defense that's banged up and they're not as good as they are they're playing well Chris Jones monster that dude is so good I love watching him he just it's for a man that size to do what he does across the entire defensive front is crazy and then you got San Francisco. It's you want to say Brock Purdy can't do it. You want to say Brock Purdy can't do it, and he did it with his legs. I mean, he—that's the way. The reason that they came back, they're so 
talented on both sides of the ball. I will say this. It is interesting. Their run defense has stunk in these postseason. Aaron Jones cooked them. David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs cooked them. Let's see what Isaiah Pacheco can maybe do. Let's see if Joe Tooney can maybe get back to solidify that line for Kansas City. I think it's going to be a great game, and I'm looking forward to it. And with the Super Bowl, when I don't have a, a, a dog in the fight, I just want it to be a good game. And I'll just throw some shekels on DraftKings. I, I was, That's what you got to do, man. Hopefully it, it doesn't come down like last year's Super Bowl to – a penalty? Was it a penalty? Like, that will always stick in my head, that pass interference or I can't remember what was called at the end of the game that basically allowed the Chiefs to kind of put. That was it. That was the hook on yeah, yeah. Um, Juju Smith-Schuster. Yeah. I mean, it's fun. You have people out there that are going to sit there, initial reaction today. Uh, oh, I'm not going to watch the Super Bowl. 49ers, Chiefs, no thank you. I mean, I'll go – to a Super Bowl party and hang out but not pay. By the time this game gets here, if you're an NFL fan and a football fan, your your mind's going to change. And like you said, go to DraftKings, throw some bones here and there, and just keep yourself into it and make it interesting. And I'm cool. I'm not like you. I'm not – I'm kind of done with the Chiefs. But it would be interesting for the 49ers, like – I found myself kind of pulling for the 49ers throughout the season uh, just because of Brock Pur Purdy. Christian McCaffrey, too, want to see what, what he does getting in there. But the other thing, John, because I'm really into conspiracy stuff online, is if the Chiefs win and Taylor Swift's there and everyone's celebrating out there, it's already floating around that the NFL has deemed the Chiefs have to win and Taylor Swift's involvement – with Kelsey, this entire season has been a giant setup for some big ending where Kelsey catches the winning touchdown and walks away with the pop star at the end in Las Vegas, John. By the way, the line has already moved to now 49ers minus one, so a point and a half okay. overnight in less than 24 hours. So that's that. The conspiracy theory also <laughs> was, look at the colors of the Super Bowl logo. The past two I years, they've been yellow and what? Uh, red or yellow and blue for the Patriots and the Rams. And then it was green and red for the Chiefs and the Eagles. Oh, it's purple and red. So that means it's definitely going to be the 49ers and the Ravens. <laughs> You're an idiot. This stuff is... <laughs> So this the script of that and all of that, although I did get a good chuckle, someone put out there, Haley Steinfeld needs to boost her numbers up so that the NFL will put the fix in for uh, Josh Allen. <laughs> there you Allen go. Come on. <laughs> Step your game up. Yeah. All right. John and I got a couple of or a handful of mini podcasts coming up as we'll go through, John, each position moving forward, uh, kicking things off with the quarterback position and what's going to happen with the backup and we'll get into what we saw, I mean, around the league with these backups coming in and being forced in. And uh, so we're going to kick that off. And then as the week goes on, we're going to go through all the different position groups as we inch closer to the Super Bowl. Looking forward to it. Okay, that's it for John Scott. I'm Kevin Carroll, as always. Thanks for joining us, everyone.